Well, at Evergreen, we were blessed with good parent cooperation. Now, I don't remember if our parent group was officially called a PTA or not. Probably was. But somewhere in those first years, Will McGann surfaced as somebody that the community parents looked up to, and she took a leadership role in the parent group. And then I got introduced to Dr. Gann and was told by somebody else, not by him or by Mrs. Gann, that he either was, or I think it was, had been, the director of the Colorado Education Association a highly respected director, and I have heard later, and I'm not sure it's true or false, that he had left it because as the National Education Association began to push what they called adversary negotiations, uh, a relationship between teachers and school boards uh, of adversaries rather than just teammates, that he had left that because he didn't agree with that left that position with CEA because he didn't approve of that approach, that militancy. Many years later I realized that I should have remembered that and turned to him for help when the CEA of Colorado was after me when I was superintendent of schools at Alamosa, Colorado. But well, again, as I'm, you know, she wasn't a uh, bossy or a uh, important acting or important looking person. She was just a decent, kind, well-dressed, but not overdressed woman. But she was a good leader. And we talked in, the, in our parent, you know, they had like a little executive board of the parent group and we'd hold meetings where it was just pretty much brainstorming. They'd tell me things they were concerned about. I'd share school concerns with them that I thought they might be able to help with. But one of the things I wanted to do based on something I'd picked up somewhere was get away from each year you elect cheerleaders and then those cheerleaders and their mothers, I hope, get together and decide on cheerleading outfits. It had sunk in on me over the years that no wonder that kids of moderate means, let alone kids from families of less than moderate means, were never cheerleaders. Man, they'd pick the fanciest stuff. Expensive. Those cheerleading outfits, I have no idea what they cost, but there was no question that you had to kind of be wealthy or nearly wealthy or willing to sacrifice if your girl was going to be a cheerleader. And I had heard from other schools working on that master's and now working on a doctorate in school administration that the answer to that was school-owned uniforms and not to replace with a new uniform every year. It's like you have uniforms for your teams and you don't buy a new uniform every year. You wear those uniforms until they're more or less beginning to show some wear and then you buy new unis every, you know, four, five, six years. Well, that, that met with some approval. And uh, I don't know, I... I have no idea. I don't remember who served on the committee, but they came up with, uh, well, some of the kids said bloomers. Well, what they were was cheerleading outfits. Uh, yeah, you showed plenty of leg, and had a little skirt and all that, like all cheerleading outfits, but they had some expansion built into them. You didn't have to be form-fitted to the things, so that, I don't remember, three or four years, we had the same uniforms. It was a good, a good thing, I think. And we had some kids, I think, that were very good cheerleaders that ordinarily wouldn't have had a chance to be cheerleaders. Well, that lasted, as I say, three or four years. And then we got a mother and her daughter on there that was, well, you know, if you say political, politically connected or not, but uh, had some other ideas. And it was in the same time frame that the nation, and certainly Jefferson County as part of the nation, was concerned about girls being too immodest. The short skirt thing was really coming in big time. Well, we were, that 
group of cheerleaders got elected and this wife of uh, one of the anchor teams for a local, not local, for a Denver TV station, lived up there in the mountains with us. Uh, kind of, I think, was the leader in that group. They had to have new uniforms, and I said, you have to have them fit the, uh, the dress code and the idea that they can be worn by successive cheerleaders for a few years. Well, all of a sudden the uniforms are made. I think I was off to summer school during the summer when they were made. Come back, my gosh. Well, yeah, they they were, uh, when you stood up, they were pretty modest looking. But girls wore those cheerleading outfits to school on game days. And by gosh, when those girls sat down, those had no bloomer effect to these. Uh, they rode pretty high on the horse. So we had some more discussion that we need to do a little change here. We need to get in a little more modest outfit. Some of the lady teachers were letting me know, you know, this is not good, not good. It's a distraction in class and so on. Well, I remember ever so clearly that the lady informed me, Mr. Riggs, in this day and age, we do not cover girls' legs. My boss, the lady boss, was, yes, we do, and the battle was on. Uh, I can't remember just how it ended up, but I know nobody was happy. My boss wasn't happy, I wasn't happy, and Mrs. Chandler wasn't happy, the mother that was the leader in that. In an earlier story, I talked about Don Ingerson coming on board as Miss Clapp's replacement and telling me, forget it. In this day and age, we've got better things to do than argue with people about the style of cheerleading outfits. And they were never an issue again. May or may not have been a um, distraction in classes. Once it was settled, it's, we're not going to fight the fight. Didn't hear a lot, uh, a lot more about it. No use of faculty or anybody complaining. It's strange the things that can be uh, issue a tempest in a teapot. <laughs>